Hello, and thank you for joining us today for the economic benefits of good ergonomics. My name is Gail Archer Hayes. I'm an occupational therapist and I work as a prevention consultant for Safe Work Manitoba with an MSI prevention support role. I'd like to introduce you to my colleague and co-presenter, Andrew Dolhe. Andrew is a professional, certified professional ergonomist working for the Occupational Health Centre. Manitoba has a five-year MSI prevention strategy um, developed and rolled out by Safe Work Manitoba and its many partners. So this initiative is a collaborative effort between Safe Work Manitoba and the Occupational Health Centre. Thank you, Gail. The MFL Occupational Health Centre is a community-funded uh, facility clinic uh, for workers. Uh, I am coming to you from our location at 167 Sherbrooke. In the, we are located in the building with Clinic and CERC. Uh, we started 35 years ago with medical services and outreach education and training. Please visit our website for information, education, and health and safety initiatives, including special projects on ergonomics with case studies, including costs and benefits. Why are we here? A lot of you think of health and safety in the ergonomics and MSIs as, uh, as injury frequency and severity issues, looking at the hazards and the risk levels, uh, looking at culture in terms of safe work and what can we do to make it a better, safer workplace from that angle. However, ergonomics is a field of study looking at humans and work. And that encompasses a lot more systems than just the uh, MSI part to it. So in this webinar, we're gonna look a little bit about uh, cost benefit analysis. But in that sense, there are more benefits when you make jobs better, safer, easier than WCB premiums. So we'll talk and show some case studies looking at quality initiatives and engineering design standard initiatives where workers' hands were feeling better and having less strain and fatigue, but also the workplace was aware of other benefits such as increased efficiency, uh, increased yield, decreased scrap rate, uh, and other improvements from a quality perspective and a human resource perspective, meaning absenteeism, which actually you could uh, measure, quantify, and help you with your ergonomic projects. Now, human factors is another sentiment for ergonomics as it includes reducing human error. So when talking to an ergonomist, they're always thinking about ways of looking at incidents, accidents that occur and looking at the human angle to it. Not so much training or why did the human being do that, but more of the bad design and how can we improve the ergonomics of the workstation to have less human error. The practice of ergonomics is not new, but often recommendations that come out of ergonomics do not seem to get traction. Those in decision-making positions, such as those who decide when and where to spend money, have historically seen ergonomics as a red line on their ledger, a costly but inevitable part of doing business, and rarely seen as a solid investment. A couple of years ago, as I was doing a cross-country jurisdictional review, I talked to Linda Sagmeister. She's a CCCPE ergonomist working for the government of Newfoundland and Labrador. She said something that completely changed the way I look at ergonomics and she put me on a journey that I'd like to share with you today. This, on this slide, I have her quote. We need to see a shift in culture whereby having an MSI is no longer a part of doing the job to being preventable. MSI prevention needs to be seen as business appropriate and not a nice to do. We need to move ergonomics out of safety and health and HR and move into the business plan using a systems quality approach. Our traditional approaches are not getting traction. So it suddenly became very evident to me that I'm part of the problem. Cost has always been kind of a background concern in my practice. I had 23 years of experience providing ergonomic services in the public sector and was focused on the comfort of the workers and the accommodations to the injured worker. I worked under the assumption that my recommendations would be followed because it was the right thing to do. Although that sentiment has merit, I live with a certain degree of frustration that very few of my recommendations actually got implemented. So now looking back, I'm thinking that it could have been that the traditional definitions of ergonomics, which solely focus on injury prevention, lead its potential shortchanged. Perhaps I and maybe others just don't speak the right language for the boardroom. 
I never learn to speak the language of my audience. The language of safety, however, is only one voice among amongst many in an organization. Perhaps it's because we rarely collect the correct metrics that would measure successful outcomes from internet from uh, ergonomic intervention, or because, perhaps because the practice of ergonomics rests solely in safety, whereas maybe it should reside in systems management, as Linda suggested. Whatever the reason, we thought it was time to make the business case to demonstrate the economic benefits of good ergonomics. And after all, we will show you that an investment in ergonomics is almost guaranteed a return on investment of anywhere from an average of two to five times. And ergonomics has place and value at all levels in the organization. Does that get your attention? It certainly got mine. So what we've decided to cover today was Andrew's going to talk about the, the greater scope of ergonomics. And we'll look at some homegrown Manitoba examples of successful stories. And we'll take a look at what motivates your workplace. Then I'm going to talk about who benefits from good ergonomics in an organization and how. So now I'm going to turn this over to Andrew. Thank you, Gail. Listed on the slide are a few of the metrics that you spoke of earlier. Now, ergonomists come from many different disciplines, from industrial engineering to rehabilitative and physical therapies, kinesiology, and industrial psychology. In a workplace, they can work within the safety department, the production engineering department, human resources, or even their research and design department. Therefore, depending on your responsibilities, an ergonomist may actually function and have different outcomes and, in, and that makes your scope quite broad. The outcomes mainly involved when, when it turns to MSI is frequency and severity. A lot more and in that past number of decades, it's been a bigger focus on productivity and quality improvements and measures. A few may actually look at health and worker absenteeism as good outcomes. I like to point out that I have seen very few full cost benefit analysis in my time which includes all the potential benefits. Most focus on potential reduction in injury, frequency, and severity. A few also include reducing human error and productivity improvements. Some workplaces have figured out that quality improvements can also occur, especially when workers' hands are not tired, strained, then the quality of work improves, but only if you look for those benefits. Now at the top, I have morale. It's listed there because it's very important. However, it's often ignored. Mainly from an economic perspective, it's hard to put a measure on it, put a dollar figure on it. However, many improvements, both small and large, uh, have an improvement in morale in the workplace. Even the act of going onto the shop floor and talking to workers has benefits. I'd like to show you a few examples of the range of ergonomic benefits through some case studies. The case studies that I'm going to be referring to came from a research project that I did a number of years ago and funded by the RWIP program. That is the Research and Workplace Innovation Program from the WCB. It involved case studies in workplaces with aging workforce issues. However, along with making the jobs better, safer, easier, we also did a cost benefit analysis. We looked at all the benefits and we looked at the costs and we developed a payback period as an analysis of whether this project was good or not. So of the 40 case studies where we knocked on the door and said, where do you have real world problems and what did we do to fix it? Many of them were very, very cost effective. Now, just to let you know, it's formatted with the spot the risk, assess the hazard, find a safer way every day logo. This is a document that you can get at the end of our talk in the resource section also on the ohcmb.ca website and also on dolheergonomics.com. From a cost benefit analysis, I spoke of something called payback period. That is something that you can uh, definitively tell whether a project is a good investment or not. So a payback period involves taking the amount of money that you have to invest into the project and then figuring out any benefits, whether it's savings or improved uh, revenue. So if a project costs $5,000 to make better and you uh, are able to quantitatively analyze the benefits as being $1,000 a month, 
then obviously it takes five months for the payback to occur. Now in counting terms, any uh, project that is under two years is a good and valid project. Under one year, hey, that's, that's two thumbs up. So what we found on the payback period for these case studies, these 40 of them, is that 22 of them, more than half, were less than one week. Very effective projects. Of the other 18, you're looking at one and a half months of a payback period. Not two years, not one year, but one and a half months. The worst case payback was actually nine months. So let's go into some of these examples now. The first project that I'm going to talk about involves reducing wasted motion. The initial workplace that was looking at the problem job was looking at awkward postures, reaching, stooping. The, the worker had to scrub equipment after use. It was hard on the body. It took about two and a half hours to do. Um, it was actually initiated mostly through a continuous improvement project under the 5S initiative of reduced wasted motion. The health and safety was actually a side benefit of that project. Now the solution was to actually uh, build this tub where the equipment could be soaking in hot water and sanitizer. And then some short period of time later, the worker would horizontally uh, lift it and wipe it down. So from a health and safety perspective, the awkward postures reduced from 30% to 5%. The time savings went from a 90 minute task down to 30 minutes. So with that value of savings, the worker is able to do other value added projects in the workplace. So the payback ended, payback period ended being three months. And again, it wasn't so much a health and safety project, it was a quality improvement project. The next, next one involves a story about increasing yield. There are many examples of efficiency and productivity gains out there in the literature or on the internet. However, in this example, the main task involved struck against incidents, but it was a secondary task that was one that had the benefits. What I mean by that is in this example, the worker needs to hold on to something called a chase board, which has some weight and specifically it has a very narrow handle resulting in more of a hook grip as opposed to what we want, a power grip. That involved more fatigue and strain on the arm. Using a chase board actually requires quick reaction time. Now, literature is very clear. When your arm is fatigued, your reaction time decreases. So looking at the logic, there is more struck against injuries. The project looked at making a chase board lighter and designed the handle for a power grip. So what we have here is a lighter uh, chase board with a power grip handle and to design that $450. There was a 20% decrease in arm fatigue, which actually led to less struck against injuries later. But the benefit that I'd like to share with you is not just being narrow focused on just this project, but looking at the other tasks that workers do. So the real good payback was the the uh, secondary task involved a lot of handwork. And this is where they actually had some quality issues and some efficiency issues where things were slower and there was errors that were being made. We weren't necessarily looking for it, but workers would say, hey, by the way, now that our hands feel better, when we do the secondary task, we're not having all these other quality issues. So once the company looked into it, they then quantified it and realized, wow, we actually have some extra efficiency and quality uh, benefits as well. The yield went up. So that payback period ended up being less than one month. The next case study involves more on the quality error specifically. Now, initially, this was a health and safety inspection that resulted in some improvement orders because workers were having the odd slip and trip injury. And it was quite obvious that there were some lighting issues and a lot of shadows. So what they ended up doing was, well, let's make the workplace brighter and see what happens. The solution was to clean the fixtures, wipe down the bulbs and replace some older uh, burnt out bulbs. Now that cost ended up being $962. Now remember it's for health and safety, slip and trips and improvement order. However, Again, because the Health and Safety Committee was looking at other 
issues and had an open ear to the workers, they found over time less rework along with the odd less statistically significant less slips and trips. So based on that, the cost of the lighting gave a payback period of less than 10 months because of uh, less scrap was happening because the lighting was better. And in the next case study, just a little word about overtime and absenteeism. This is something that hard, is hard to get some numbers on because you, unless you do some surveys, you don't know if, if absenteeism is due to I'm feeling unwell or my back hurts, I don't want to go on WCB, but I'll just take a day or two off. Over time, that's a little bit easier to quantify and deduce. When a worker is away from work, but yet work needs to get done, someone else has to come in and fill in. So this is a case study looking at uh, an office environment where the worker is saying, hey, Andrew, it's me. I'm getting older. It's an aging worker issue. But how do you know? Unless you do first an ergonomic assessment. So step one is let's look at the seating. And in this case, the chair was not a good fit. It had a concave uh, backrest. The keyboard tray had a plastic edge and a very, very small area to move the mouse. And because they wanted documents in front of them, the monitor was in the corner. And on the right-hand side, that is a hazard that we call direct pressure hazard. If something that we see a lot in office environments where people are leaning their wrists on a hard edge, whether it be a desk or in this case, a plastic tray. So the solution was actually to do proper ergonomics. It wasn't, it's me getting older. It was to actually design the workstation to basic principles and standards. That did involve a new chair that fit properly. It involved a keyboard tray that didn't have hazards. It involved a footrest. It involved also a height adjustable, angle adjustable document holder that allowed the monitor to be put in front of the worker. So now you're within ergonomic standards and guidelines. They actually measured and found to have a lot less absenteeism. So based on that, the payback period was calculated as four months. So a $1,400 project made its money back in four months. So what else is happening on the other eight months? You're making money on that side. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about what motivates your workplace. Workplaces and individual decision makers are usually motivated to apply resources based on five drivers. Basically, how do you move from point A to point B, which is a better, safer workplace? So you may find that the culture of the workplace or an individual within the workplace might be one or a combination of these drivers. So what I found is if you have a health and safety project, you could simply go right to the decision makers and say, we have back strain, we have a solution, give us this amount of money to make it go away. But sometimes it helps if you can frame it with a continuous improvement strategy. There are workplaces out there that are very tuned into efficiency, quality, customer service, where health and safety considered a, ben a bonus. They do health and safety, but it's a bonus of doing uh, this continuous improvement. So like my 5S example, the very first one, wasted motion. You can say, we wanna make our backs better, but also we're gonna reduce wasted motion. Maybe that will get the attention in the ear of some people. There are workplaces out there that are really truly only motivated by legislative compliance. They just wanna meet the requirements of the act and, re and various regulations. So for your information, we do have a regulation on MSI prevention. It's number eight, and it basically says, spot your hazards, assess them, find a safer way and, and make it better some way, somehow. So sometimes that improvement order is what motivates people. The next driver is what I find to be the, the bulk out there of, of fear of the unknown. There are workplaces out there that want to do the right thing. They just don't know the difference between a day to day and pain and, and an actual identified hazard. They, they, they think that uh, ergonomics might end up being a dump truck full of money going into a bottomless pit. However, with education and uh, resources, you can show ergonomics in terms of these are the principles. This is how we uh, assess tasks. 
this is how we're going to find solutions that work, good ergonomics. And if you, at that point, you need to do a cost benefit analysis, there are many examples out there that you can tie in and do for yourself. So there are resources listed at the end of our webinar, plus a lot of those case studies that I've done in the past that can help you with that problem. There are also workplaces out there that say, Andrew, I don't really care about WSP premiums. I don't really need to worry about legislative improvement orders. I have skilled workers that are good at their job and now they're hurt. That's hard on my workplace. So I wanna minimize the loss of skilled workers. What do I have to do to make the jobs better, safer, easier? So in that sense, you can tie your little wagon to what the driver of this workplace, which is we don't wanna hurt people. So let's, let's do a project and find out what we need to do, okay? Also on that note, besides the, what you would call the red light hazards that you wanna obviously improve on, there's many workplaces that are looking at their jobs that are not that bad, but it's still a little bit too difficult for a lot of light duty workers or return to work accommodations. So one strategy that I found uh, is very effective is going to management and saying, hey, why don't we uh, put some resources into making some of these okay, not, not so good jobs better so we can actually accommodate more workers. And the last one is WCB costs, right? There's a lot of workplaces that are attuned to their firm rate, where they are, how much they're spending. So they're interested in the direct and indirect costs that relate to premiums. And now speaking of WCB premiums, I'd like to share you some statistics on injury rates that you might find interesting. In 2019, MSI time loss claims ended up being around 34%. Now non-ergonomic claims was an additional 22%. That is where someone falls and hurts their back. Not necessarily a bad design issue, but it's under MSIs, but the root of ergonomics is 34%. That represents 4,292 workers. This next slide is quite interesting. I like to share with you actual and theoretical MSI claims and costs. What I have on the left-hand axis is the number of claims. And on the right-hand side, I have costs. Along the x-axis, I have the lost days. Now, truth be told, most MSI claims only last a few days. And with that, the cost would be actually quite low. If you were to look at a job that a worker was lifting something heavy from their ankles, twisted over once every five minutes, you may you may have some confidence in saying sooner or later, they're going to hurt their back, but how bad? Is it going to be a muscle spasm? Is it going to be something that requires surgery and they're off work for a very long, long time? Is it going to be very costly or are they going to be back to work under light duties the next day? No one can predict that. So going back to my graph, a lot of the claims for MSIs are one to two days and technically not very costly. If someone said to me, Andrew, what's the average? Well, through the business intelligence of WCB in 2021, the average cost is $4,000 plus a little bit. And the average lost days is 48. So let me ask you this. What about the claims that last a year or two? They're out there. They do happen. What's the cost that is, that is associated with that? Super high extremely high. So I like you to take a step back and think about your own workplace and say, hey, it's good enough when I make a presentation to say the average lost days is 48 and the average cost is $4,000. But if anybody says, hey, I know so many people that no lost time or only a few days, the cost must be so low. Yes. But what about the one or two or four or five or eight that last few six months to a year or two years where the medical costs skyrocket? So let's talk a little bit about return to work for a second now. I have found that many workplaces have really focused more on the light duties, but not because of what you think. I've titled this the burden of light duties and too many return to work accommodations. 
So let me ask you this. What happens in a workplace when there are too many walking wounded? There are so many accommodations, so many people needing light duties, but you actually run out of jobs to fit them in. One, they're either on, uh, they're either at home, not contributing to the workplace, or let's say you're in a workplace where there's a job rotation between number of jobs, uh, an easier job, a medium job, and a heavier job. Well, with all the light duty jobs being taken up, or let's say all the easier jobs being taken up by return to work accommodations, that leaves your healthy workforce to rotate between hard job, hard job, hard job. What's that gonna happen when it comes to productivity, quality issues? What about the psychosocial issues that wrap around that and the inherent morale that happens? So let me ask you this. What if you made a strategy in your workplace where you looked at the yellow light, moderate hazard jobs, and you focused on making those better? Maybe not necessarily spending a lot of effort and resources and money, but enough to take a job that might not be returned to work acceptable and actually making it then acceptable so that more workers are able to do those jobs, not be at home or that way. So in conclusion, workplaces have seen significant benefits by looking at what happens around return to work and light duties, and the cost benefits are there in, in, in abundance. So now I'd like to turn it over to Gail to continue on with his presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. And what does this mean in terms of actual costs? Earlier, Andrew spoke to the cost of WCB premiums and fines and whether that was a motivator for your company. So let's take a look at what that might mean for your business. This is how WCB firm rates work. Chances are your company has been grouped together into a rate code category with other companies of similar work and with similar injury rates. You are all paying a certain amount per $100 of payroll to the WCB but it can vary from company to company depending on how your injury rates are. For example, in this example, if you are at the top of the rate code, you could be paying say $2.27 per $100 of payroll. In the same rate category, if you are at the bottom, you might be only paying 85 cents. And it may not sound like much, but based on a payroll of say 4,500,000, for example, it could mean the difference of $64,000 between the top pairs and the bottom pairs. So where would you rather be? These injuries are not inevitable and the cost of doing business. And as Andrew has said earlier, for the most part, putting into place an ergonomics program and some engineering controls could reduce this burden substantially. We talk about um, ergonomic program. So what does it look like? Everyone can have an ergonomics program. It won't look the same from business to business, but everyone is affected from, by MSIs, so, and their impact on quality and productivity. So it would be prudent at some point to allocate a budget for ergonomics in your company. According to the Manitoba um, Safety and Act, Health Act and Regulation, Part 8, an employer um, is obligated to have an assessment performed um, by a competent person if there is a risk of MSI. A competent person will be somebody who has the education and experience to perform the task. So you might want to consider training your or one of your own staff to take on this, this role. Otherwise, you could be contracting out of, you know, an external from outside your organization. Whatever your situation, it does make sense to establish an ergonomics budget to cover the human costs for the assessment and from the recommendations, any costs that are related to um, equipment, tools, or uh, other modifications. So uh, listed here are some components of a robust uh, economics program, and it can be an entire different conversa topic of conversation on its own. So um, I'm gonna say for further information, you might wanna consider checking out the Safe Work Manitoba website. In 2006, 
Washington State Department of Labor Industries uh, conducted a study on 250 companies who had put in place an ergonomics program and who had collected data to determine the return on investment. This is perhaps one of the largest studies done to date on the outcomes of ergonomic intervention. Then in 2015, they actually published a table to summarize their findings. And this is a segment here in the slide. So this is an example of three out of those 250 uh, companies. So you'll notice that the data was collected in different fashions and some sections actually left blank. And that's because different companies collect information in different ways and rely on different matrices. This leaves us comparing apples to oranges to pears, but that's okay. The consistent underlying message is that they all showed a positive return on investment or cost benefit analysis, no matter what information was collected. So in many cases, the investment is in the assessment and education. Um, controls do not always have to be huge capital costs, but sometimes they are. There is a link to this study on the last slide of this presentation in case you're interested in looking it up further. But I wanted to introduce the study because the numbers on the next few slides are based on the study's findings. For the next little while, I want to talk about who can benefit from good ergonomics in your, in your organization, and I'll propose that there's value at all levels. This is information uh, based on the studies and presentations by that Washington study that I mentioned last slide. Um, a study cited below by Jay Dahl um, et al. and researchers at Velocity EHS uh, Human Scale. I don't think anyone can argue that ergonomics does not benefit the worker. It's well established that good ergonomics um, improves the physical well-being of workers and allows them to work in less discomfort, which results in better health and safety outcomes. Um, it's most relevant how when programs are participatory, which means that the workers have an active role in the development of controls and procedures and solutions for uh, risks in the workplace. When a work play, worker is in an environment which, which is ergonomically sound, he or she will find that the jobs are easy to perform. That is huge. It has huge implications. The worker will see a reduction in fatigue and discomfort. But it goes beyond musculoskeletal comfort as well. Good ergonomics plays a role in psychological health as well. It improves the work experience. Workers do not dread coming to work in the next day because of related to pain, discomfort, or being overwhelmed by production demands. It, when a workplace is set up more logically, the working heights make sense, the tools are designed for the task on hand, it enhances job satisfaction overall, and workers feel more involved, more engaged, and more committed to their um, companies. And did you know that engaged workers have been shown to be 20% more productive? So all this adds up to better commitment, fewer injuries, better comfort, and a better work culture. So what's the impact of good ergonomics on the supervisor? They are the key, really, to the success of an ergonomics program. But what's important to them? They are, after all, the ones who need to recognize MSI risks in the workplace. They need to know what good work looks like and what poor work looks like, and then how to mentor their workers to work safer. They're also the key people in the creation of work culture that's inclusive and supportive. What if supervisors were able to use ergonomic tools to facilitate the most efficient work from their workers? What if they could adjust work organization um, uh, parameters such as job rotation and rest breaks? After all, workers work best when they're not feeling overwhelmed and their efforts are appreciated. What if good ergonomics less, led to less absenteeism? Finding replacement workers, training them, and monitoring them to bring them up to speed can be a huge chunk of time for a supervisor whose time could be better spent doing other tasks. So research indicates that good ergonomics may result in a decrease in absenteeism of anywhere from 42 to 116%. And that's a huge time saver for the supervisor and a huge substantial cost saving for an organization as well, in direct costs and in indirect costs as well, as well. How can your HR department benefit from good ergonomics? The numbers show that good ergonomics can provide tangible results to your human, your human resources department. Some of their traditional concerns include things like retention, the cost of training and retraining, turnover, and overtime costs. 
We've already inferred that good ergonomics can have a, a beneficial impact on all of those. The Washington study reported that good, a good ergonomics program can result in a reduction of turnover on average 23 to 48%. Do you know what turnover costs your company? It's calculated that turnover costs business is about 33% of the average annual salary. Now, if that's $44,000, um, for every turnover position, then it will cost your business about $14,000 plus annually per hourly worker. So I'm sure that's money better kept in the company's coffers. Good ergonomics can be beneficial to the safety and health team of any organization. We talked earlier about WCB costs. The Washington studies suggest that the savings in WCB costs are as listed on this slide, and those numbers are large. See where it suggests a reduction of 68% in WCB costs? If your annual WCB costs are, say, $450,000, just imagine the savings. That's a reduction of $306,000 in WCB alone. So instead of paying $450,000, you're paying $144,000. Better in your pocket than the WCBs. One of the key roles of safety and health that I would encourage is to keep track of the revenues and cost metrics involved. This will help everyone recognize that safe savings often get buried because each person may be handling a budget, um, or your budget may be handled by a different person in your organization. So there's, unless there's great communication, the right hand often doesn't know what the left hand is doing. So the metrics that could be included include uh, keeping track of all your investment costs in the ergonomics program. So it means assigning a dollar value to the resources invested, such as manpower, purchases, capital costs, equipment, that sort of thing. You also need to keep a dollar value to the benefits returned by the ergonomic improvements. This means tracking improvements in productivity and quality, it means tracking changes in traditional HR indicators like employee retention, absenteeism, lost days, and replacement costs. Um, it means tracking the decreases in your worker compensation costs as well. And then to be really on top of things, if you keep track of the savings and reinvest them back into your ergonomics program year after year, it allow you to cover expenses and eventually the program will fund itself separately from the regular operational budget. And that is a great place to be. And what is the impact of good ergonomics on productivity? There's a whole spectrum of value to ergonomics before you get to injury and injury reduction. When those involved in productivity measures look beyond musculoskeletal injury risk, they'll find that there's a direct link between improved ergonomics and improved productivity that is traditionally being missed. And Andrews alluded to that in the case studies. And why? Because work can be done more efficiently with fewer breaks. With good ergonomics, your deadlines can be met more reliably and regularly. That has a huge impact on your customer service and your reputation. And in terms of efficiency, more service um, of a product can be produced with less effort. And why? Because you've decreased or eliminated all that wasted motion. All that reaching, bending, carrying, transporting, pushing and pulling has all been dealt with and reduced, which will also reduce uh, fatigue factors. So, as I developed this presentation, I reflected on the many assessments I have done in my past as an ergonomic service provider, and there were many times when the issues and recommendations of those assessments were related more to efficiency and the reduction of human error. But because I was housed in safety and no injuries had actually occurred, there was no one listening at the other end. What I failed to explain sufficiently was that these changes would have had the potential to increase productivity and accuracy by up to 25%. Had I been housed in production, my practice or productivity, pardon me, my practice would have been the same, but the lens reviewing my recommendations would have been very different and perhaps the company could have saved lots in the long run. And what is the impact of good ergonomics on the quality people? There are those who argue that the benefits of good ergonomics are is so significant that they should actually be housed here. Quality managers um, are interested in the cost of scrap, reworked, damaged goods, and the impact of delayed or missed shipments. 
Studies show that jobs with higher MSI risks and, and demands can expect an increase of 6.5% in quality errors. So poor ergonomics leads to frustrated and fatigued workers that do not always do their best work. When the job is too physically demanding on the workers or too mind, mundane and mind numbing, uh, they may not perform their job efficiently. So for example, what happens if you, if a, when a worker does not tighten a bolt or a screw enough, tightly enough or in a production line, what happens down the line with that part or that piece? Chances are that just one slip can contribute to scrap, rework or damaged goods before the item leaves the shop. Now, if there was an ergonomics program and an ergonomics service provider, picture this scenario. What if that ergonomic service provider suggested a power tool to tighten the bolt to offset the high force requirement? What if they suggested a change to the workstation design to reduce the reach and the loading? Do you think that might improve efficiency? And what about the time spent on a certain task to reduce pain or discomfort or even boredom? What about implementing periodic stretch breaks to reduce fatigue? So would these interventions have made a difference to the end product? Of course, in fact, it has the potential to improve the end product, the numbers say, by 58 85%. So rework and scrap costs are normally budgeted at a given percentage of a company's annual expenses. Just what, think of what an improvement of 58 to 85% could save. Your leadership includes your business owner, its C-suite, its board of directors, the stakeholders. Bottom line, it's their responsibility to manage the finances of the business. So their concern is turning a profit. There are a couple of statements that should be of interest to your research, to your leadership. Research consistently shows that companies focused on worker well-being and workplace improvements, such as ergonomics, outperform the general stock market by about 5%. And research shows that the return on investment averages about one to five, which is significant enough for leadership to set up and take notice. Your leadership needs to be convinced that the investment in ergonomics is of value to the organization. They need to understand that improved ergonomics and health and safety does make good financial sense. But how do we get that message across? That requires learning the language of the boardroom. The language of safety will only get you so far. As Andrew spoke to earlier, find out what motivates your company, whether it be reducing WCB costs, maximizing the potential of your workforce, fear of the unknown, legislative compliance, continuous improvement, or the moral duty as the foundation of your pitch. Find out what is important to your leadership. Then learn the language of money. Learn the language of data and the terms related to profit and money flow, such as back, you know, back pay period, cost effectiveness and return on investment. Learn how good ergonomics can impact and benefit all these concepts so that you can show and measure how good ergonomics makes good economic sense for your business. So this is what your leadership needs to have confidence in. When you pay attention to the health of your workers, their safety and ergonomics. Research has shown that these components can enhance the company brand, lower costs, improve productivity, and come out with a better product quality. Overall, you've got better business performance. So, in considering the value of ergonomics at all levels of your organization, your task now going forward is to determine what motivates your company to invest in good ergonomics. Conduct ergonomic assessments with the lens not only to reduce musculoskeletal injury and risk, but also to address things like efficiency, human error, issues of fatigue, and the impact of product quality and on all those um, HR metrics. Establish a system to collect the correct metrics and be really able to define what the costs and the benefits are from good ergonomics. And as I said earlier, if it really, if to be really on top of things, you want to roll back the savings back into the program. And finally, consider including ergonomics into your systems management. As I said earlier, the product, the practice of ergonomics uh, remains the same, but the value is seen through a different lens and so expands its potential. So thank you for joining us today. We hope that you found this information above to be of value and uh, we have provided here a list of resources and our contact information. 
So wish if should you wish to follow up on this area of interest. All the best and thanks for listening.